Uh, my name is Ryan McKenzie. I am a performance engineer at uh, IX Systems. And if you don't know what IX Systems does, it's actually a pretty cool place to work uh, because they allow us to come to conferences like this and they support us to come and, and network with everyone. And then they also allow us to do interesting investigations like this to divert ourselves and some of our effort and do need investigations and share the results. Uh, we are the maintainers of the FreeNAS project and we also have a uh, enterprise storage line called TrueNAS, which is based on that software with some extra features and stuff. But uh, just thanks, thanks to IX Systems for sending me. Um, so that's my current life. In a, in a previous career, I was a uh, lecturer at, in the de Department of Computer Science at uh, University of Kentucky. So uh, if, if you need me to slow down or, or repeat something, that's fine. I know not everyone speaks banjo. Um, banjo slow. We're okay. Slow banjo. All right, cool. So, uh, but also, you know, uh, I've been up in front of rooms of 700 college students, but uh, this is a little bit of a different environment where, uh, you know, pr there's probably people in the in the room that uh, know more than me about ZFS, anyone from Oracle. <laughs> so uh, I'll give you guys $20 if you don't grill me too hard on ZFS. It is open ZFS we're talking about here today, not Oracle ZFS. But uh, anyway, I'll just go ahead and get started. That's a little bit about me and where I work. So what are we doing today? Uh, just a brief overview of how open ZFS works. So really, something that's not on the slides, and I like to talk a little bit off the slides uh, from time to time. It's a good thing to when I was a teacher, kept my students a little more engaged. Um, the, uh, the two big pictures for this uh, agenda, really, if you will, are there's a technical big picture, which is L2ARC, the Level 2 Adaptive Replacement Cache, um, has for a long time now sort of um, been one of those, the, the recommendation has been don't, uh, don't use it with certain workloads but maybe it'll work with future technologies. And now that we have NVMe SSDs becoming very available, um, we are going to reevaluate that. Uh, the other big picture of this talk is sort of a meta, uh, a meta talk, if you will, is knowing how to tune your system means you must know your solution, you must know your architecture and your implementation, and you also must know uh, your, your workloads and, and the applications you're going to deploy them into. So uh, I don't know what's making that noise. Is it the projector? Maybe my laptop is doing that. I don't know. Yeah, it sure was. Oh, yeah, audio goes over HDMI. How cool. <laughs> Told you I wasn't a developer. <laughs> OK, so let's start with uh, Brief overview of ARC and L2ARC. So um, ARC stands for Adaptive Replacement Cache. It resides in main memory, so it's global. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the server, the filer, it's shared by all the storage pools. Um, basically, all the incoming or written data uh, gets, goes through the ARC in one way or another. And the really cool thing about ARC is it balances between most frequently used MFU and most recently used MRU. And that does some protections against things like uh, cache scanning, where if you have a backup workload or something, uh, you still have your most frequently used lists in your ARC that aren't getting really perturbed by the backup workload and things like that. So uh, ARC is really neat. This is the focus of our talk, L2 ARC, uh, Level 2 Adaptive Replacement Cache. It's actually configured and added on a per pool basis. So some of your pools can have ARC, and some of them cannot have ARC, and ARC can be even configured differently on different pools based on what those pools are used for, which is good. Um, there's a concept of warm data, things that are about to be evicted from ARC. And we'll learn more about that in just a minute, but the L2 ARC tries to feed itself with blocks that are about to be evicted from the main memory ARC. So, uh, we'll talk about what that means and how it determines what is about to be evicted. Um, the other interesting thing to note is that all of the blocks that are in your L2 arc have a, have a header component that's actually stored in the main memory. So 
there's a couple caveats to remember there. So I'm going to move really quickly through these introductory slides, uh, but you feel free to ask questions. Um, when ZFS writes, you got a write request that comes in. Um, if it's an async write, the, as soon as that block gets copied to main memory, we're going to acknowledge to the to the uh, requester that the write is complete. If it's a, if it's async write, a sync write takes a little bit longer. And on this slide, I want to give a plug for Nick Principe's talk last year at SDC 2018. He gave a very similar talk to this last year, but his talk was how you could improve this portion of your OpenZFS system using NVDIM. So I'm giving a talk about maybe using NVMe SSDs here. He gave a talk about using NVDIMs here. And this log is basically, and it's called the ZFS intent log. And a slog is a separate log device. So the ZFS intent log by default is sort of striped across all of the data VDEVs, which can be slow if you have a very uh, heavy synchronous write environment. So a lot of NFS environments are pretty synchronous heavy. So one way to speed up the acknowledgement process is to put a fast device as a separate log. And that can be an SSD, uh, but it can also be an NVDIM. Uh, in certain cases, or an NVMe SSD, either one. So, uh, at some point later in, in time, the, uh, the the block that has been written gets copied to stable storage. It's no longer "quote unquote" dirty, um, and all is well with the world. And now we have this neat block in Arc. So we we've got a block that sits in Arc, and if that block is going to be rehit, if that block is going to be hot, it will stay there. It will be promoted to the heads of the most recently slash most frequently used uh, lists in the arc, just like any other block. So, and if, if it's just something that gets written once and never gets written again, it will fall to the cold part, the tail of the arc, and it will get evicted. Uh, reads. Reads are a little different. So if a read request comes in and the block we're looking for is in arc, we have an arc hit, which is awesome. We're hitting main memory. That's, that's what we want. That's why certain ZFS-based servers, I mean, have many, many terabytes of, of main memory because ARC will grow to consume all that memory and use it, uh, and it'll give it back if, it's, if, it, if your system needs it. But we want ARC, we want ARC hits with reads. ARC hits are, are really, really low latency, very, very fast. Um, if it's in L2 arc, we're going we're gonna to see from our header over here in the arc, we're going to see, oh, that's a block that I've got stored in my L2 device. So we're going to go get that block from L2, which is another tier that's sort of between your main memory and your, and your, uh, your slower data VDEVs here. And then we're going to return that. Uh, in the case of a miss, we have to actually copy data up from our slower data VDEVs. So we're going to copy this block that's been missed on up. And then we're going to acknowledge the, the read. Yes? Uh, yeah, that'll be one of the next slides. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty important concept of how things, once they get warm or cold in ARC, how they get into L2 ARC. Yeah, that's one of the next slides. Thank you for the good segue. <laughs> uh, so we're going to, this is called a demand read. So we're demanding data from our, from our VDEVs in our pool up into ARC. We're going to acknowledge if ARC prefetcher, so there's a, there's a, a part of an ARC read uh, system call that tries to determine if something is a, is a streaming workload. And if it thinks it's a streaming workload, it may not actually be a streaming workload. It's just if it thinks it is. It's going to actually copy some more blocks, too, to maybe try and avoid another miss. So we have concepts in ARC. If you look at the ARC statistics, we have concepts of ARC miss, uh, ARC data miss, ARC prefetch reads, prefetch misses, metadata reads, metadata misses. There's lots of statistics around it, which is awesome for a performance person, because if you capture all that stuff, you can, you can really do some damage. Uh, and then once that stuff is demand read, into ARC, it again stays there. So this, this is really 
Think of this as there's, there's two ways something gets in ark. It either gets in ark because it was demanded, or it gets in ark because it was written. Those are the two ways things get in ark. Um, now, how do things get in L2 ark? Oh, wait a minute. Yes, this is how things get in L2 ark. So, as I said before, ARC will actually grow to consume almost all your system's memory. Um, it's kind of a feature. <laughs> uh, if you read the forums, a lot of people don't think it's a feature, but, I, you know, if it's well-tuned, it's a feature. So, what's happened is you have to have a, a headroom of, of available main memory for incoming writes. Because think about what would happen if your memory was full, and every incoming write has to hit that memory. It's going... If, if there was no free memory and you had to immediately transaction group your sync your dirty data down to your slow spinning rust drives, your write latency would just go through the roof, right? So we have to, we have to sort of do some housekeeping and maintain some uh, room in ARC for incoming writes. So that's what happens. Um, that's also why the L2 ARC feed is completely asynchronous of the arc reclaim or the arc uh, things falling off the end of arc because imagine if you've got a block that's cold and it's in your main memory and there's a, a write coming in and if a write comes in it has to wait for a block to then be copied to I mean this L2 arc is is faster than your data V devs but it's also slower than memory so this is actually going to also increase your latency so this whole process being asynchronous, loading, loading L2 arc, feeding L2 arc asynchronously of arc evictions it, and cleaning up arc, uh, it really is optimized to keep our write latencies very low. So, so periodically, and these things in yellow are tunable, so how often it is scanned, how much it scans, how many blocks it copies into L2 arc, it's all tunable. So that's Really, all, the, all three of those things combined are called the feed rate. The feed rate of L2 arc is tunable. So we're going to go through and we're going to look at close to the tails. And just imagine if there's a dotted line here, uh, you're going to look at either more of the tail or less of the tail. That's called headroom. That's tunable. So we're going to look in here and go, okay, these are getting ready to fall out of arc. We don't really know anything about them, but we're just going to copy them into L2 arc in the background for fun. <laughs> so that's really how uh, L2 arc feeds. It's completely asynchronous of, uh, you know, it doesn't really know anything about those blocks. It's just saying, oh, these are getting ready to fall out of arc. So we're going we're gonna to take those into the next tier down instead of letting them fall all the way out to slower stable storage. Uh, okay. So... When L2 arc quote unquote gets full, which means we're sort of at the end, so things, are get, things get written in a round robin fashion to all the develop, available L2 arc devices. So if you have two L2 arc devices or four L2 arc devices, they start writing in a rotor round robin fashion. And then when you get to the end, it just says, okay, uh, let's just go back to the beginning. And then the, you know, it starts back at the beginning with the new blocks that are being promoted and it invalidates the old uh, indexes to these in the headers. And, uh, you know, so L2 arc is, if you have L2 arc on your system, it is constantly feeding something at some rate. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is what do we feed it? How fast do we feed it? That kind of thing. And under, what, under what workload scenarios? Yes. So when there's no L2 arc, these just get reclaimed. And they disappear from main memory. They don't have another tier to go to, so they're going to be on your data VDEV. They're going to be on your spinning rust or whatever your slowest, whatever quote-unquote stable storage is in your system. So L2 arc is sort of making an effort to, instead of just dumping these all the way down to stable storage, L2 arc is making an effort to put some things in a middle tier that makes them maybe useful at some later time. Uh, yeah, well, we'll talk also about capacity, but yes, uh, ideally, based on your workload, the capacity, the capacity of L2 arc should be based on what you're using it for, obviously, but 
that's kind of the, the old classic pyramid, right? We teach in computer science is, you know, your CPU and your on-chip cache is at the very top, but it's very small. And then your main memory is a little slower and a little bigger. And then your next tier is a little slower and a little bigger. So, uh, but yeah, that's conceptually the idea. Yes. If you keep writing the block, so the question was, if you keep writing a block lots of times, um, does it end up being just overwritten in L2 arc? So there's two mechanisms to keep that from happening. There's the most frequently used list in arc. So if, if something is, is close to the top of these lists and something that you're hitting over and over again is going to be close to the top of this list, it's not going to get down here to the point where it's in L2 arc. And the other mechanism is if it's already in L2 arc, it's going to look up here and go, oh, that's, I've already got that. So I'm not going to copy it again. So any, any block can either can be in three states. It can, be there, it can be either in arc only or L2 arc only. It can be in both. But that is only a sort of a temporary state. So it can be in both right, right, right now. I've copied it from the tail of this list. It's here until it gets evicted. Now, if this thing gets rehit and gets promoted back, you actually have it in both places. Uh, that's what we call a wasted feed. We've fed something to L2 arc that too early. Basically, we've we fed too fast. It's, it, it never was going to fall off the end of of arc. So, any other questions? Because this is key. If we understand how the L2 arc feeds, we can understand how to tune it in different scenarios. Uh, again, if, the, if an L2 arc then becomes dirty, if an L2 arc block then becomes dirty at some point, let's say we've got a block here that we've brought into L2 arc and it gets written from the outside, arc is just going to handle that. Arc is, as we saw in the third slide or whatever, arc is going to say, okay, this is a dirty block. I'm going to put it as part of a transaction group and I'm going to get it to stable storage at some point. And then this block in arc is just not going to be used until it circles around and gets written with something different. So we don't ever have anything dirty in ARC because um, it would be an extra step to have to flush ARC. Or, sorry, we don't ever have anything dirty in L2 ARC because it would be extra steps to flush L2 ARC and slower. So here's just some notes. Um, this is, these are very text-heavy slides. Um, so like a, like a true teacher that I am, I'm going to give you guys homework. I'm not going to read them all. You can download the slides if you're very interested. But um, this is a very interesting point. The, the blocks are variable size. So if you've got a, if you've got a block or an ob, if you've got a block workload or a file workload or an object workload, whatever your block size that you've set on that particular data set or that particular pool or that particular share, that's what the size of a block is going to be in arc. You can have, you know, you can have 4K, you can have 1 meg. So some of these blocks are 1 meg and some of them are 4K on a mixed use system. We're just going to talk about blocks. Um, and whatever those are, they are. <laughs> but that, you know, takes into, you have to take that into account when you're sizing, especially if you have everything set to a really small block size, you're going to have lots and lots of metadata. So you may have to tune your uh, metadata percent of arc. You've got a lot of metadata overhead if you've got, you know, if you've got a, a petabyte system with 4K block sizes on everything. That's uh, probably a, a misconfiguration. Um, your SE is going to be in trouble. Um, blocks get into ARC either by a demand or prefetch read miss or by a ZFS write. That's the only way they get into here. Now, here's the, here's, this, is, this is worth the price of admission to this talk. Here's a configuration pitfall. Uh, it can only get into L2 arc if it's been in arc first, right? We learned that just a few minutes ago. So a lot, what a lot of people do are like, oh, okay, so um, let's set our primary cache, let's set our arc to metadata because it's fast, and then let's set our L2 arc to catch everything else, all. Well, guess what? You're not going to get, 
you're not going to get anything in L2 arc, right? Because it can't get into L2 arc unless it was already in arc. So that's something you have to know about the way ZFS caching works. Because a lot of people, and we see this in the forums about every month on FreeNAS forums. They're talking about how their, arc, their L2 arc never has anything in it. It's because they've, they've, there's these primary cache, secondary cache settings, and they've got them set in such a way that what you're telling arc it's allowed to copy is something that's also never in. Or you're telling L2 arc to grab things that are never in arc. So it's looking at the, arc, the tails of the arc list going, uh, there's nothing there I'm allowed to copy. There's nothing there I'm allowed to feed. Right, so that's a configuration pitfall. Um, L2 arc is not persistent. Uh, parentheses yet. Um, blocks, the blocks themselves are persistent in the L2 arc because you're, you're talking about an NVMe SSD or you're talking about an SSD or maybe a 15K SAS drive in some deployments. The actual blocks are there, but what's not there? Something we saw earlier. The header information, right? The, head, the headers reside in main memory. So if you lose power, the header information that points to when, when a user reads, we're going to look in our header, and if, the, if we lose main memory, if we reboot the system, the header is, is gone. So basically, when the system comes back up, it goes, oh, L2 arc's empty. I'm going to start at block zero. So that's a configuration uh, pitfall and a, uh, something to note there. Uh, Right, heavy workloads can churn the most recently used. It's, it's not going to churn the most frequently used. Uh, we talked about that a minute ago. Prefetch heavy workloads can scan. So like uh, I was talking about a backup workload can scan the ARC because if you are the recipient of the backup, you're going to get writes. That's the first bullet point. But if you are the, um, if you are the source of the backup, you're going to have a lot of sequential reads, which are just going to go through and your most recently used list is going to completely be scanned all the time uh, until the backup is complete. So that's a neat feature of, of ARC, how it has the most frequently and the most recently used lists because it sort of protects your VM uh, guest, guest OS data that you want to stay in the most frequently used list. It, it, it sort of stays there. Uh, what's happening um, is uh, you're going to, yeah. Let's see. I think I already talked about all that. Blocks that L2 arc doesn't feed may not be hit ever, or blocks that L2 arc does feed may never be hit again in, that, in the case of uh, scanning and, and churning, and that's a wasted feed. All right, so let's talk about some key performance factors that we got from, because the first step is really understanding the architecture. So what's a random read-heavy workload going to look like on this guy? Well, uh, L2 arc is actually designed for this. Brennan Gregg uh, put L2 arc NZFS in 1996, and uh, all of his comments in the arc.c, and a lot of his blog posts and some of his papers that he wrote about it, uh, it is designed for being a random read-heavy cache. So we expect it to be very good. Uh, sequential read-heavy, not originally designed for this, but again, the original design document said future SSDs, future storage technologies might make it such that it's going to work out. So we're going to revisit that today. That's the, uh, that's the big data component of today's talk. A uh, write heavy workload, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's random or sequential, is going to cause what we call memory pressure. Every time we write to a ZFS file system, we need that block in memory to be free. And if we're doing a ton of writes, it's going to cause what's called memory pressure. So we're going to very, very quickly be reclaiming blocks from the tails of the arc lists and very, very quickly. And a lot of those are probably going to go by without being uh, fed into L2 arc. Um, some of them are going to be fed into L2 arc and probably never touched again. And that's a wasted feed. So uh, the design intention was to do no harm, but we think there may be an impact and we're going to show some of that later. The background performance of actually feeding L2 arc. So if you're in this situation, your L2 arc is never really going to be warm. Uh, because it's always going to be grabbing new stuff because the tails of those lists are going to be perturbing all the time. So it's going to be grabbing new stuff all the time and it may never be hit again. So we have to, and, and actually those mem copies, they use CPU time, they use resources. Those NVMe SSD drives 
writing to them actually costs us. So in some cases, it may be better not to have the L2 arc or at least mitigate how much feeding you're doing of the L2 arc to prevent that. Uh, the active data set size, if it's small, it's going to probably fit in L2 arc or it may not never be fully warm, but uh, we'll talk about that. So really, active data set size is a very important thing for you to know about your workload, about your solution that's deployed, uh, because otherwise you're not going to really know if you're going to be all in cache or in cache plus L2 arc or largely on disk, and that really impacts how you design your solution. All right, so let's look at a few tribal knowledge things. Now, I've only been around uh, in ZFS land for about a year, a little more than a year. So there's probably more um, secret incantations out there. But these were ones that I heard um, amongst our ZFS developers around, um, is that L2 Arc is not, not helpful for, for sequential workloads. But if you do have a sequential workload, you need to segregate it to a different pool. So you have a pool over here that's for sequential streaming, and you have a pool over here that's for your random VM stuff. So uh, you would fix that at config time, or at deployment time. Uh, there's a no prefetch setting that basically says L2 ARC, you can, you can feed yourself anything out of ARC except for things that have got there by the prefetcher. Remember that slide we talked about where we missed something and a demand read it up into the ARC? And the prefetcher said, well, this looks like it might be streaming, so I'm going to get these three or four blocks here. There's actually accounting on this. And the accounting says these blocks were demand, these blocks were prefetched, because that will actually tune it, the arc will actually tune itself later. If it, if it finds out that almost everything it's prefetching is a miss, it'll say, okay, maybe let's not do as much of that. <laughs> so the arc is actually a really cool uh, self tuning thing. Sometimes it's smarter than it needs to be. Uh, and then a lot of people say set, set the secondary cache so that only metadata gets into the L2 arc for those. Uh, those pools and data sets that are uh, doing streaming workloads. So even though you may not be hitting that you've got these large streaming files, you may not be hitting the data blocks very much, let's, let's just put the metadata in there, uh, and that's going to help. So we're going to try and uh, validate some of these. But they all seem more or less plausible given what we've learned about the architecture. Here's the fun part. So here's our solution our test. I sort of uh, highlighted the, uh, in yellow, the parts that are sort of important. Um, so we have a 512 gig main memory on this system. That's more or less your, what your arc is going to be, the arc size. Because on a FreeBSD open ZFS based storage server, your arc is going to grow to, if your workload is sufficient, and in a performance lab it's always sufficient, you're gonna, your arc is going to grow to consume almost all your main memory. Um, we have some enterprise grade dual port, because just saying an NVMe is not enough. Just saying, oh, I've got some NVMe's in there. Well, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about, you know, uh, Evo 960's or M.2's or U.2? What are you talking about? So we've got some U.2 enterprise grade dual ported PCIe Gen 3 times 4 or by 4. Uh, in the system, so these are these are these are big boys. Uh, we've got a lot of hard drives, and uh, we're working with a big data set. Well, a fairly big data set. It's a 1.2 terabyte data set. It is uh, specifically designed. That that active data set size was specifically chosen because it will fit. Uh, it will not fit in ARC. So we're going to always be uh, not. We're going to be missing. Arc missing a lot. It's also designed so that um, the active data set will always fit into L2 Arc. Even if I'm using one of those 1.6 terabyte drives, it'll fit in there. If I'm using two, it'll fit in there. If I'm using four of them, it'll fit in there. So, um, and we're doing some preconditioning here to make sure that this is fully warm before we take our measurements. And my, um, one of my acceptance criteria to move on with measurement period is that the arc size plus what, is, what has been fed to L2 arc is greater than or equal to 90% of the active data set size. This is a pretty safe assumption in my environment because 
you know, this is my system and I'm the only one running workload against that thing. You know, if you're on a mixed use system, some of that data in L2ARC is not going to be your data. So uh, this is kind of a, this is a clean room uh, metric. Uh, possibly some blocks won't be there yet, especially with random, and we'll see that. Um, we actually rebooted the system when we added, so I tested one L2 ARC device, and then I added a second, and then rebooted the system to basically clean those headers we were talking about earlier. So that uh, this is actually another pitfall. If you add L2, the L2 ARC devices, they can skew result. Now this is only a pitfall in a testing environment, because let's, uh, you know, in a, in a deployed, you know, production environment, you want to add a second L2 ARC device, you put it in there and add it, and what's going to happen is, over a very, very long period of time, you know, that first L2 ARC device may be very, very full, and if it's a big NVMe SSD, you know, three, three or so terabytes or something like that, uh, it's going to take a while, and then the other one is basically empty, it's going to take it a while to load level along those. So I didn't want that, I wanted everything to be starting from scratch in my test environment. So every time I added a new L2 ARC device, I rebooted the system, cleaned out the caches, um, and I validated that there was balanced read-write activity. Because when I first started doing it, I was like, oh, I'm just going to add the second L2 ARC device and see what happens. And then I pulled my disk statistics out. And, uh, you know, I've got one that's doing like 80% of the L2 ARC hits, and I've got one that's doing 20%. Well, what's going on here? Well, cause it's because the first one was loaded and the second one wasn't loaded yet, so. Uh, the only really important thing here is active benchmarking. You guys can go back and look at the rest. Active benchmarking basically is a, is a term that means we're not just caring about the top level performance metrics of IOPS and latency and, and bandwidth. We're actually caring about what, is, what are each individual disks doing? What are each individual VDEVs doing? Let's go out and collect the, the profiles, the TPM counters and the profiles. Let's go do all this other stuff while the benchmark is running. So if it's doing something weird or unexpected, we can find out why. You know, I'm not going to present that information today or very much of it, but as a performance engineer, I care about not just what the system is doing, but why it's doing it. Um, so that's, that's an in-house automation that we've worked on the past couple years. So let's do some 4K. VD Bench is the load generator, so this is a very synthetic uh, random 4K workload. Okay. Uh, the only really unexpected thing is that uh, one and two NVMe devices sort of perform about the same. They don't scale. But then four really scales. Um, that's a deep dive that I have to do. But uh, you can see here that, uh, as expected, that the L2 arc is very effective for a random read workload. So more than six times the ops and uh, compared to the no L2 arc case. And even though something strange is going on here between one and two L2 arc, it's still very, still very beneficial. Um, I suspect there might be something going on with the round robining of the drives. So I'm, I've engaged my ZFS developers about that and we're looking into it. So it's, it's really cool when you go to a meeting and you're, and you're presenting performance numbers and your, your main ZFS developer goes, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> you never want to hear a, a, a base level, like an operating system level developer look at you and say, that's exciting because that's really actually, real, that's, that's another word for scary. <laughs> yes? Super linear scaling between one drive and Uh, what what uh, thread? So this is these are threads. This is no L2 arc. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have called that out. This is no L2 arc. These are one and two L2 arc devices, kind of laying on top of each other, which is the weird, exciting thing. <laughs> and this is four L2 arc devices. Uh, and actually, the benefit can be seen even down here at the low thread count, which usually that's not the case. Usually, you know, your single threaded uh, aggregated workload is it's very, you know, they're kind of very tight down here. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, let's look at latency. We have a uh, major reduction in latency 
and actually at the higher thread counts, the uh, reduction in latency is more significant. But what I think is really cool is at the low thread counts, because a lot of media and entertainment uh, customers are going to have maybe one application running on one workstation looking at a, a, a share or a data set. So this is a very important metric if you're, if you're playing in that space. Yes? Right, so the, uh, the, the block diagram of our server essentially is what you're talking about, is whether or not they're plugged into some sort of PCIe switch behind the scenes. They're um, actually plugged into a, uh, a backplane that does not have any uh, PCIe switches in them, but they are, it is all fed by a single by 16. So we have a single by 16 on the motherboard. And then that backplane plugs into that, and it, it I guess, uh, aggregates it out to uh, four by fours. Actually, it's four by eights because these are dual port by four. So, okay, we're only using one at a time, so we're not oversubscribed. Yeah, and. That's about as deep as I can go into the hardware design of the system. <laughs> yeah, I've taken it apart a lot of times. <laughs> but uh, yeah, any other questions? These are very good questions. I appreciate them. Uh, this is just basically proving that uh, we're collecting the, the individual. This is one L2 Arc device. We're collecting the individual statistics for each, each uh, drive. So the client aggregate here at this thread count, which when I say quote unquote best, what I mean is it is uh, not the maximum ops that we achieved, but it is, the, it is the highest ops we achieved before the latency started curving upward. It's kind of the hockey stick uh, thread count because this is thread scaling. So the client aggregate is getting about 200 megs per second and the single NVMe is servicing half of that, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we're, uh, if we look at the ARC stats, we're seeing that even with this massive, um, by the time this preconditioning is run, and it took 12 to 16 hours for the preconditioning to satisfy my metrics, the ARC, is, the arc has tuned itself to the point where it's actually still getting a 20% hit rate at this point, which is really impressive considering it's 256 gig memory and a 1.2 terabyte active data set size. We're still getting 20% ARC hit. It's, it's really well tuned. Uh, we still have some errant feeding. So what this is, we're actually writing into the NVMe SSD. MVD0, you can tell, is the only one active at this point. So we're getting some errant feeding at the beginning of this. Um, it, is a, it is a purely synthetic workload. So there are probably going to be, even though my NVMe SSD is, is big enough to hold like every single byte of this workload of this active data set size, by the time the measurement starts, that's why I had that 90% threshold, by the time the measurement period begins, there's still going to be some errant feeding going on here. We're still going to be churning the tails of the arc a little bit. So, uh, Let's see. So this is with two. The, uh, the sawtooth thing you're seeing there is actually just an artifact of how we collect our stats. Uh, some of the time series is from the thread counts may be shifted a little bit. So. Uh, client aggregate again is about 200 uh, millibytes per second, and the, uh, the two NVMe are servicing about 100. So this is this result is similar to the single NVMe result, and we can see that each NVMe SSD is doing about 50 uh, millibytes per second this time, as opposed to 100. So we know that we know that the that the devices can do more. Uh, we just don't know why they aren't in this particular case. Um, we're going to really see better scaling here with four, four NVMe devices active, client aggregate bandwidth at 450 millibytes per second, and uh, two, uh, we got 250 of that coming from the L2 Arc devices themselves, and each one is doing, I would call that 75, which is pretty good. 
what what I would really look for here, what I saw early on is that early on when I was when my methodology when my methodology wasn't right and I was just adding the adding the devices, some of these some of these drives were doing a lot more than others. But we're at we're we're at a balance here. So here's just a I guess this is the takeaway slide from the random reads. This is the L2 arc effectiveness. So this is the ops versus response time uh, hockey stick chart. And you can see even at the beginning, we are far, far lower with this active data set size. Now, these aren't hero numbers. You know, our marketing team doesn't care a lot about these numbers because the ops numbers are actually a lot lower than what we can achieve with this system. But this is a 1.2 terabyte active data set size. I mean, that's something to get pretty excited about because you're way, way, way bigger than your cache. I mean, we're not, this is not a cache hit number. So we're at sub milliseconds on an active data set size that is far, far larger than our cache, which is a very exciting result. Um, and we scale out. We scale out to this magic. This is, a, mad, this is a, a number that the marketing team cares about. We're actually up over 100,000 ops with that, act, with that large active data set size. So this is something they can use in sizing, which is pretty cool. So 670% increase in uh, operations per second and a 670% decrease in latency at the, um, at the 16 thread data point. Uh, this is sort of a cautionary tale of quote unquote moving the bottleneck. So with no L2 arc, this system is very happy. We're using very little of the CPU. But when you add all of the, L all of the NVMe SSDs, your CPU is no longer waiting on slow drives. So your CPU is actually copying buffers. Your CPU is just real busy. So just as a cautionary tale is as you, as you incorporate faster and better storage tiers, you're probably going to need more CPU at some point because uh, you're sort of moving the bottleneck. Yes? I do not know that, but I can find that out for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is, okay. Okay, uh, that's, a, that's more of a question for our hardware qualification team <laughs> and how they configured these drives. They were handed to me and said, these, hey, we're think, we're, these have been qualified for use in, in our system, so check this out. Uh, sequential read heavy, this is really where the crux of the talk is. I'm going to spend the rest of my time here. Um, this is 128K sequential, 100% read. Again, it's very synthetic. Um, something cool happens here. Um, so first of all, the cool, the cool thing that's happening here, first of all, the, the, the wisdom said MV, uh, L2, L2 arc is no good for sequential workloads. But we've shown that it's very effective. It can be very effective with the right devices. Um, so we're getting 3x the bandwidth versus no L2 arc. I don't know why the colors changed, but I apologize for that. Um, so we're getting three times the bandwidth of, compared to no L2 arc. But actually, what, what's happening is as we increase thread counts, uh, wow, the, you know, the performance goes up. Um, we sort of did a deep dive on that, and we realized that once we have so many clients and so many threads happening, uh, the traffic as it arrives to the storage array starts to look random. It doesn't look like sequential anymore. So when you've got 12 clients like I do, and you're running 128 or 256 threads per client of a very synthetic VD bench workload, it begins to look like random at the server. So sequential reads begin to look like random reads. Response time is much the same story. Uh, Prefetching. You can actually see, this is, this is how we diagnose that, that weird hump we were seeing. You can see that the, uh, the prefetch reads start to go way down. So the arc itself is saying, well, there's, there's nothing here to prefetch. This is not a, at this point, about this point, arc says, well, that's not, that's not streaming. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna mark that as streaming. Uh, so that's actually how we diagnosed the previous, uh, the, the phenomenon we saw in the previous results. So neat stuff. 
Uh, much of the same. This is something that, uh, you know, we have the balanced, um, the balanced performance between all, all of the NVMEs. Here's the money shot. And actually, this is a, this is a neat, you know, if you, see a, if you see a scaling curve like this, it looks weird. You're like, why, why is it doing that? Well, the reason it's doing that is at this point is where we stop prefetching. At this point is where, uh, from the server perspective, we're no longer doing a streaming read workload. We're now doing a random read workload because the thread count is sufficient to where things are interleaved and it starts to look random. So we get, we get a little bit more scaling. So really, really this becomes, this changes workload profiles right in the middle uh, in the synthetic lab uh, environment. So we got about a 60% or 60 to 70% performance increase out of L2 arc versus no L2 arc for sequential read. That's a result because a lot of people in the ZFS space are saying don't use it for sequential reads. Um, and this is why. All my data fits in L2 arc. Well, so this is a testing I did a long time ago before our, uh, before our active benchmarking automation was complete. So I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of collateral data on this, but this is a, a much smaller server, uh, kind of the same workload, 128K VD bench sequential read workload. Um, but this is a 400 gig SSD as L2 arc instead of an NVMe SSD. So this is a SAS SSD being used as an L2 arc device. And uh, this, is a, this is actually a much smaller, um, a much smaller uh, active data set size. So we get all of our data in L2 arc, in the L2 arc case, we get all of our data in L2 arc and we think, yeah, that's cool. We're in a, we're in a faster tier. Well, that one SSD drive is not nearly as fast as our 142 hard drives, SAS 10K hard drives. So actually what happens is we get stuck behind our latencies and all of our requests sort of get stuck behind that and we're, it's, it's a very bad thing. So this is why, this is why that, that uh, previous assumption existed. So here's some, uh, some, some people were saying you know, not to do prefetching into the L2 arc or only do metadata into the L2 arc. With older and slower and fewer L2 arc devices, this made sense, but in our, in our testing, none of these mitigation factors really made any sense. If your cache devices are fast enough, it makes no sense to keep things out of L2 arc. It only makes sense to keep things out of L2 arc if your L2 arc is not well suited uh, to serve the workload. So. I've been given my five minute warning, so I'm going to skip a lot here. Right heavy workloads um, are bad, okay. <laughs> so basically what's happening is uh, either it does, no, it does no harm, just like the designers of L2 Arc say, adding L2 Arc does no harm, or we have some up to 20% regression in, in ops, IOPS workload because what we're doing is we're spending a lot of CPU cycles writing to those NVMe devices constantly. So in those, in those previous results I was showing you, at some point we're writing, we're writing, we're writing, we're feeding L2 arc. At some point the feeding slows down and we get those CPU cycles back to use for client workload. This never happens here. We're constantly turning the arc. We're constantly under memory pressure. We're constantly using those CPU cycles to feed L2 arc. And so our actual client visible performance decreases. So this is, this is probably the money shot for the rest of the presentation. There are two key metrics uh, that you can calculate to size a system or configure a system for L2 work. The first one basically says, hey, is my active data set size going to fit in my L2 work? Okay. Uh, the second one basically says, is my L2 work fast enough to make that a good thing, right? Because if you get, you can get all your data in L2 arc, just like I showed you before, but if you get all your L2, all your data in L2 arc and L2 arc is slow, that's a bad thing. So, key metrics there. Um, what type of drives, you know, your bandwidth and ops and latency capabilities are going to rest on your type of drives. Um, segregated pools versus mixed pools um, with segregated data sets is, is a couple of things you can do. Um, so, for example, if you have smaller drives, like you were saying earlier, if you, have, if you can only afford very small NVMe SSDs, 
then you kind of want to segregate those off to the, to the pool or the data set where it makes most sense. Uh, capacity. Um, large, data, large devices can hold more of your data. It will take longer to warm. In a deployed environment, that probably doesn't make any sense. Or that doesn't make any, any you, you want, you want, it doesn't matter how long it takes to warm. You're going to be running for years, hopefully. So you don't care how long it takes to warm. I only care about that in my lab. Um, there, is a, there is a thing that can happen where if you have like a 64 gigs of RAM on your system and you have like, I don't know, 100 terabytes of L2 arc, you're going to eat up all of your arc with the indexes to your L2 arc and the headers. So your arc hits are actually going to go down. So beware of that. Probably not a good idea. Uh, device count, our device count show, our, our testing shows that device count actually improves latency uh, because it's basically spreading the load if you have more devices. What are you going to feed? If you have a slow L2 arc, um, you want it to be demand fed, not prefetched. Uh, if it's a fast enough L2 arc, you want to feed everything. And those fast enough is that ratio I showed uh, a couple slides ago. If you're writing, you basically want to do those mitigation practices where you segregate the pool. Uh, finally, know your workload. And this is kind of preachy, uh, teachery stuff, but if you're a customer looking at evaluating a storage uh, solution, know your workload, know the app, at least the applications. Uh, and if you're a vendor, know your architecture. Don't just go out there and say, yeah, L2 works awesome. NVMe is a rocket. I'm going to strap myself to that rocket. So not necessarily. You can actually uh, have problems there. So, so the big picture here is with enterprise grade NVMe SSD devices as L2 work, we have reached the quote unquote future that Brent and Greg mentioned and uh, we can now have it as an effective tool for a streaming workload. So thank you. I'm going to give you some more homework. Please download the slides for more content. And uh, please rate my talk in the SSD portal. So thank you.